Okay, I'm making a quick video. Um, I had someone ask me, a sister in Christ, had my wife ask me, you know, well, what about this person? I see him, brother, brother, over on Brother Brian's channel where people are asking, Brother Brian, what about this guy? What about that guy? What do you think of this guy? What do you think of that guy? And I got to thinking that my answer is always, what is, what do they believe in? Some people call them the fundamentals. You know, what do they believe in these areas? Okay. And um, I realized I don't have one of those. And when you look at some of these people's sites, it's very hard to kind of get out what they exactly believe when it comes to um, specific doctrines. So I wanted to do a video because I don't have a website that you can go to and say it says what we believe and everything. I wanted to do one uh, just explaining all the major, or what I consider major doctrine, the major things that I believe here at this ministry that God has blessed me with being a part of His ministry. So the first thing and the most important thing is what's the true gospel. And if you come across this and you're lost, I pray that you at least have the patience to listen completely when I'm talking about the gospel because now is the time of salvation. It's so important that today is the day of salvation. Okay. Um, I am a King James Bible believer, so we will be using the King James Bible. So, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 7 9. If you're lost, one thing that you have to understand is that you are a sinner. I know it's tough um, to drop the self-righteousness, the attitude that I'm a good person, I'm not that bad. Um, you're going through life and you're wondering what's going on. I mean, something just doesn't, just doesn't feel right. And the Bible talks about, whether you believe it or not, talks about that if you're truly seeking God, you will find Him. So if you're coming here and you're listening to this and you're truly seeking God, you're going to find Him. So the first part of salvation is repentance. Okay, Coming to God as a broken sinner. Not saying I'm a good person. Not saying, well, we're all sinners. Not saying they're sinners. So what's the big deal about me being a sinner when they're a sinner? It's a personal thing, one-on-one. -on -one. You've got to come to a point in your life where you're like, I'm no good. I'm no good at all. I mean, this life I'm living, I'm running 90 miles an hour, and I'm going nowhere. And any time I come to a stop, everything comes crashing down. So what do I do? I get back to going 90 miles an hour again. I hide in things, whether it be movies, TV shows, video games, drugs, alcohol, uh, fornication, sports. Anything that's fleshly, you hiding that. And when you don't do those things, you feel like there's something wrong, you feel like you're miserable, sorrow, whatever, and everything just feels wrong. Everything feels like it could come collapsing down at any moment, so what do you do? You turn around and go back to those fleshly things to hide from the fact that there's something wrong with you, and there's something wrong with this world. But it's a personal thing. Repentance. Coming to the Lord saying, hey, I'm a sinner. Okay? 2 Corinthians 7, 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Okay. Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorrow, sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Okay. You have to have sorrow in your heart for sinning against God. Realize your life is wicked. You're no good. There's nothing you can do to be a good person, to be perfect. Only one man was perfect, and we're going to get to that in just a second. But you got to understand that, A, you're no good, and you got to understand the consequences of not being good. What does that mean? Um, hell. Um, for the wages, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Okay. Bottom line, you are a sinner, and because you've sinned against God, you're on your way to hell. Two things you've got to understand at the very beginning, not just here, but it's got to hit here too. And I'm pleading with you to understand that you are a sinner on your way to hell, 
and you deserve to go to hell. I deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. Okay? And when you hit that brokenness and you stop and you realize that, hey, you stop running the 90 miles an hour, you stop looking in all the wrong places. If you're seeking God, you're going to find, you're going to go to the wrong places sometimes. I did. I had a brother in Christ that just went through so much stuff, false religions, false teachers, going through so many books, trying to seek the truth, and it took him a long time, and God brought him to the truth. That we're going to be talking about a lot of the things in this video. But if you're truly seeking God, you're going to find Him. And you need to drop your self-righteousness, and you need to stop looking at this world, and you need to look at yourself and say, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against God. There is a God. There has to be a God. You look around at everything, all the things around you that was created by God, you look at there and say, there's no way that could happen by chance. Okay? You've got to repent. You've got to come to God as a broken sinner and understand the consequences of that sin and having sorrow in your heart for sinning against God, putting a wall between you and God and saying, I don't want to go to... Because of that wall, I don't have a relationship with God anymore. Not that you had before, but I'm saying you can't have a relationship with God because of that wall, because of your sin. But who can tear down that wall? Okay. Second step, when you come to that broken part, you've done great. You've gotten to that first part, I'm a sinner, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner on my way to hell and I deserve to go to hell. Something's wrong with this world, there's something wrong with me, there's got to be more to this than this fleshly life I'm living. You get to that point, and that's when you're truly seeking answers, you start realizing you're seeking God. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also received, which, also, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, he died for your sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ came to earth. God manifest in the flesh. He was born of a virgin, Mary. He was raised as a boy. He grew up as a man, you know, living in a, in a like you and me. He could be hurt. He, could, um, he needed to sleep, he needed to eat, he needed to rest, you know, he needed to breathe, okay? God manifests in the flesh. He was perfect. He was sinless. He never sinned at all, okay? And when he paid the price for your sins on the cross, his beard was ripped out. He was whipped within an inch of his life. He had flesh torn out, blood gushing out. He was put on the cross, nailed to a cross, okay? Cursed is every man that hangeth upon a tree, the Bible says, okay? He was being cursed. The Bible says he became sin who knew no sin, okay? He paid the price for your sins, and he was innocent. He was perfect. He was innocent. And the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that he is God, you have to get to a point where you take that truth and that fact and you put it into here and you believe it. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe Jesus is God. He's perfect. I believe that he died for my sins and he rose again the third day. You've got to get this belief in your heart. Right. You admit that you're a sinner that you're no good, you're on your way to hell, you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God, and God says, this is how the wall can get torn down. This is how you can be reconciled to me. Reconciled means to, when you're enemies, you can be reconciled to where you're friends again. Okay, how does we get reconciled to God? How do you get reconciled to God? By going through Jesus Christ. For there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Okay. You've got to believe in Jesus Christ. So repentance is you admitting that you're a sinner and having sorrow for that sin and understanding the consequence of sinning against God. You drop your self-righteousness. You turn to God. 
Turn to His righteousness, which is Jesus Christ. At that point, if you're still with me, it happens in the heart. It's not an outward thing yet. It's something that happens in the heart. Someone will verbally tell you these things, like I'm telling you right now. You're going to go, go for a walk, or you're going to sit down somewhere, and you're going to start pondering these things. They're going to start making its way into your heart. And you're going, to, uh, you're going to believe that you're a sinner. You're going to admit that you're a sinner in your heart. You're going to believe the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is and what He did for you in your heart. That He's God and He died for your sins. When that happens, that's when you... I would go, to, go on your knees. Some people pray, depending on what you're doing, you pray right where you are right now. Unless you're driving, pull over if you can. Because a lot of people will listen to these videos while they're driving on earplugs or they hook it through their system. You can be doing some work, uh, stop somewhere, get on your knees, sit down, and pray to the Lord. Everything that I've been telling you, you need to make it personal between you and the Lord, saying, Lord, to Him, letting Him, telling Him that you are a sinner. He knows it, but He wants to hear from you. It's called, a, you get to start a relationship with the Lord. You go to Him and admit that you're a sinner. You tell Him that you understand the consequences of that sin. And that you're sorry for sinning against Him. That you believe. Tell Him what you believe. Tell the God what you believe about His Son, Jesus Christ. That He died for your sins. And only He, His blood, can wash your sins away. That He is perfect and that He is God manifest in the flesh. And only God can save you. Okay? You confess both of those in prayer to the Lord. You can do it right now. You can do it anywhere you are, and you do it in your words. I'm doing an outline, but make it personal between you and the Lord, and it has to have to do with sin, admitting that you're a sinner, and your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that sin, you have to have sorrow in your heart. It's always about the heart. It's always going to be about the heart. Okay? Once you've done that, you're already talking with the Lord, and the Lord will look at your heart. And then you look at God and say, God, I'm no good, I don't deserve to go to heaven. Please save me. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do to make it to heaven. Please save me, Lord. Okay? Um, for your confession and belief, Romans 10.9 talk about it. For call upon the name of the Lord, Romans 10.13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The confession... For that if, thou conf if thou, uh, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You want God to save you? That's what salvation is. I don't know if you've ever heard the word salvation before, but salvation is God saving you. You want God to save you? You need to repent. You want God to save you? You need to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You want God to save you? You've got to confess both of those in prayer to the Lord. You want God to save you? Ask Him. Say, Lord, save me. Why do you ask God to save you? To prove that you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I'm a dirty, and I said this before, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, and I was on my way to hell, and I deserved to go there for sinning against God. And this is something that was happening in my heart. And it's only by God's grace and mercy that He prepared a way for me to go to heaven, to be reconciled to Him, though we're not enemies anymore. And that's through Jesus Christ. So that is the true gospel in the King James Bible. I'm pleading with you, if you come across this and you're still with me, Please, 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 now is the time of salvation. Today is the day to get saved. Right now is the time you need to get saved. The world is just getting worse and worse. And, gosh, you don't want to put off t the saying, you don't put off tomorrow what you can do to today. Who knows what's going to happen? You can take this to heart and you get saved today and get hit by a bus tomorrow and you're in heaven. You can ignore this, what I'm saying, and say, well, maybe later, or I don't care what you have to say, and tomorrow you get hit by that bus and you wind up in hell to burn for all eternity. It's so important that it gets done today. Work it out between you and the Lord today. Okay. So, but now, 
that said that, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what I believe is the true gospel. If you skip repentance, your belief is in vain. If you don't confess both in prayer, the Bible says, uh, verse 11 on Romans 10, For the scripture saith, Whoever, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If you refuse to confess both in prayer and start your relationship, that's the first time God's going to hear you in prayer. First time. That's when you start your relationship with the Lord. You're ashamed of him if you take that out. It says to salvation. So the first prayer you pray to God happens before salvation, God saving you. Okay? And then calling upon the name of the Lord to save you. A lot of people like to take that out too. And it talks about how you're, you ask God to save you because that's your way of saying, I don't deserve it. Lord, I don't deserve to be saved. Please save me. People like to mess that up because Satan does not want you getting saved. Brothers and sisters in Christ out there, if you've been like me, a false convert most of your lives, you've gone through so many different gospels, and when you came to the real gospel, the one I just preached, you're like, this is the truth, and then you go back and look, I can see how so many people are getting confused today. They think getting saved means they have to go to these buildings that they like to call a church. You get saved, don't go to church. Okay? It's not in the, in the Bible. You're not to go to these buildings. Okay? You're going to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When you get saved, you are part of the church. And when you get saved, praise the Lord, your life's going to change. Your life is going to change. After salvation, there's a changed life. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, you, you'll be start being told, you'll have a love for this Word of God, and you're like, Lord, thank you for saving me. You're going to have a love for the Word of God. And you, God's just going to start showing you a lot of things. He's going to start cleaning up your life, and you're going to start having peace that you've never known. Uh, the struggles are still going to be there with your flesh, with sin, and things are going to change the, lost, the way the lost world looks at you. And we'll get to that a little bit. Uh, there's going to be differences after salvation. Change life and how people are going to treat you. But it's worth it. Do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? Those are your only two choices. Everyone has an eternal soul. You can spend eternity in heaven or you can spend eternity in hell. So... Ephesians 2 7. This is the big one that uh, people who try to tell you it's just belief only. You don't have to repent. You don't have to call upon the name of the Lord. You don't have to confess anything. It's just you believe in your head. You believe in your head and you're automatically saved. They like to screw this verse up. That in the ages to come he might show, see Ephesians 2 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are ye saved. God's grace is what's going to save you. God's the one that does the saving. Not me. Not some man standing up there behind a pulpit with a suit and tie. Not the Pope. Not Catholics. Not Mormons. Not whatever Jehovah's Witnesses, Lutherans, Baptists. Buddha, Muhammad, all those false systems, false people, they're not going to save you. Only God can save you. And He does it through Jesus Christ. And it takes faith. You have to, believe, you have, to have faith that your repentance is genuine and that you are a sinner. I, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I have sorrow for sinning against God. That takes faith to do it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You're confessing your repentance that you're a sinner hoping that God's hearing you. And you're praying to a God you can't see, the evidence of things not seen. You're calling out to a God you can't see. So when you do this as a lost man or a lost woman, you're showing great faith and admitting that you're a sinner, having sorrow for sinning against God, and acknowledging the consequences of sin. You are showing great faith when you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that He died for your sins, and He is the only way to heaven. 
You're showing great faith when you confess both in prayer, talking to the Lord, starting your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You're showing great faith when you call to God and say, Lord, save me. The faith there is you're saying only He can save you. And that's right, only God can save you through Jesus Christ. And we talked about a uh, new creature after salvation. New creature in Christ Jesus. Okay. Thing i got to touch on now. So at this ministry, we believe the true gospel. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord to save you. And we push, because the Bible teaches that after you get saved, not before, after you get saved, God's going to start changing your life. He's going to start changing your life. You're not going to be the same person you were before you got saved. And it's not just this feeling inside. It also shows, there's an outward showing. It starts in the heart, but it reflects on by the outward showing. Uh, I'm going to not jump ahead anymore, but bottom line, the Bible says, hey, this is wrong. Your attitude towards sin is going to change to where when you were lost, you didn't care. It was a good time. You justified sin. It's no big deal. Now that you're saved, you struggle with sin. Oh, Lord, I have to give that up. And you've got a conflict going inside you, a fight, a war between your flesh and your spirit. I really have to give that up. And you, and you give it up. It might take time. You might wrestle with it for a little bit. But you will give it up for the Lord. And, as, and that's just small things to big things. Over time, you're going to be giving things up for the Lord because the Lord says you're not to do that. And the Lord's going to say, you're supposed to be doing this, and you're going to start doing it. Your life will change. It's guaranteed. Okay. I'm not going to lie to you and say you can just believe and go on living however you want to. I'm not going to lie to you and deceive you like that. Getting saved means a changed life. And you will have one, and it's great. I'm telling you, it's hard, but it's great. True peace, true love, and the blessed hope that you're going to heaven when you die. So... Hell, point out uh, a lot of people what we believe about hell. Hell is eternal. The punishment in hell is eternal. There's no annihilation. Uh, hell is not just, you know, a figment of people's imaginations. Hell is real. The number one motivator for you to get saved is realizing the consequences of sin, which is hell. Okay? Revelations 20.13 and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Remember what we talked about with Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What's that talking about there? Every person is going to have to answer to God. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, therefore every I hope I'm not butchering this. Therefore every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Saved and lost, we're going to be giving an account of ourselves to God. Okay. If you're lost, this talks about how you're going to be judged by your works. And if you've had so much as one sin, one sin, you're going to hell. If you reject Jesus Christ in this life, and you're standing before God, Jesus Christ, at the great white throne to be judged, if you have so much as one sin, you're going to hell. Have you ever lied before? Then you're on your way to hell today. You're on your way. You're not there. You don't have to go there, but you're on your way. All you need is Jesus Christ, and you don't have to go there. But one sin. Have you ever took something without asking? The Bible calls that stealing. Have you told a dirty joke before? Uh, these are small things that people just think it's not that big of a deal. To God they are. A sin is a sin. There's some sins that have greater consequences than others, but one sin makes you worthy of hell. And that's what that's talking about. Okay. Matthew 25, 41. This is a difficult one for people to understand. This is why you need to get saved. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was, I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also say, Then shall they also 
so answered him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungry and a thirst and a stranger and a naked, sick or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into, into, into life eternal. And the whole point of me reading that is that part right there. It's eternal punishment, everlasting punishment. Everlasting fire, verse 41, everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's another important thing to realize. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. It wasn't created for you. It wasn't created for me. You don't have to go to hell. Get saved today. Come to God broken. Right? Broken. That's the important part. You're truly seeking God, you will find Him. Got a couple more verses here on hell showing that it's everlasting because people like to say it's annihilation or it's just a state of mind or some weird stuff out there. I'm being honest with you. Hell is real. It's eternal. You're going to be burning for all eternity. Like I said, eternal soul. It can spend eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven or eternity in hell with Satan. Okay. Matthew 13, remember, for the devil and his angels, that's what hell was created for. Matthew 13, 50, And shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's going to be what's going on in hell. It's a fearful thing. It's always a fearful thing to be in the, under the, in the hands of an almighty, righteous God who's going to judge you one day. It's supposed to be a fearful thing. 2 Thessalonians 1 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? Everlasting destruction, okay? Everlasting punishment. Revelations 14 11, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they had no rest day nor night, who worshiped the beast in his image and whosoever received the mark of his name. Bottom line, Eter punishment in hell is eternal. There's no escaping that. You can try not to believe it, put it in the back of your head, ignore it, brush it to the side. It doesn't change the fact that hell is eternal. Now, I plead with anybody who comes across this video that they get saved today. Hell is real. You don't want to go there. I don't want you to go there. Uh, there's great teaching showing how people in hell don't want you to go there. Lazarus and the rich man. Um, but we, true Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian men and women, we don't want to see you go to hell. People in hell don't want you to go to hell. God said He wishes that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want you to go to hell. He's made a way for you to, come, to get out of having to go to jail, hell. He's provided a way for you to go to heaven. He doesn't want you to go to hell. When you wind up in hell, you're there because of you. You've had tons of chances before you die, to go to heaven, to believe in Jesus Christ, to drop your self-righteousness, to confess that you're a sinner and have sorrow for sinning against God, everything we talked about. I pray that you do that today. Now, we're going to get into the meat of this whole thing. It's just me showing what I believe and this ministry stands for, God's ministry that He's allowed me to be part of. That's the true gospel. Get saved today, brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't, I don't want to jump ahead, but we will be talking about preaching the gospel. Um, but now is the time of salvation. Time is running out. Time is running out. You could die tomorrow. You can die in five minutes from now. Time is running out. So, we got to get to the big brunt of it. Like I said, this ministry is a King James Bible-believing ministry. We believe that the King James Bible is God's perfect written word in all matters of faith and practice. Okay. Matthew 24, 35, Mark 13, 31, Luke 21, 33, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It was said in three books of the gospel. It must be very important. John 14, 23, what does it say in John 14, the book of John? Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Okay? I'm a King James Bible believer. I'll be back in just a second. 
Sorry about that, I forgot to grab these two books as a show and tell. <laughs> um, King James Bible Believing. The Bible says that God promised to preserve His perfect written word. Okay, in the Old Testament it talks about how He's elevated His word above His name. So, to explain this a little bit better, the Bible version issue. Everything we talk about, the gospel and everything, I'm going to try to do links down below on these subjects so you get them in more in-depth study. This is just me outlining and showing a few verses what we believe here. There are studies that have been done by Brothers in Christ that are really, really good studies. And I'll try to link some of those. Um, the reason is, is the Bible version issue. This is called a Texas Receptus. Okay, it's got the Hebrew and the Greek. I think that's probably the Hebrew, but Hebrew and Greek. This Texas Receptus comes from Antioch, Syria, where Christians were first called Christians. That's where these Greek and Hebrew texts come from. The Greek texts come from um, Antioch. If you know your Bible, that's where Christians were first called Christians. They didn't call themselves Christians. It's what the lost world called them. So, I just want to throw that out there. I don't have a Nestle's Elan, which is okay. I, God blessed me. I came across the New Testament in Greek, Westcott and Hort. This Greek text that leads into the Nestle's Elan, um, that has the, they claim to have the two oldest and best manuscripts, um, which the Vatican, the Catholic Church, owns, is how this went from this and got into becoming the Nestle's Elan. And the Nestle's Elan, the Greek text, comes from Alexandria, Egypt. So the whole point of this is to let you know that there's two parts of the world you're getting your Bible from. Texas Receptus, King James Bible. Nestle's Elan, Every Bible after that. Okay? The New King James likes to blend the two. But the Nestle's line, like the NIV, New American Standard, all the other what we call Bible perversions come from Alexandria, Egypt. The King James Bible is the only one, the only Bible, 100% based off of the Texas Receptus. Well, not 100% if you do the thing, but it's based off the Texas Receptus. Okay? This right here is backed by over 90. 8 to 99 percent of all Greek manuscripts line up with this right here. Line up with the King James Bible. 98 to 99 percent. Less than 1 percent. Alexandria, Egypt. Less than 1 percent. All these Bible versions. I used to have an NIV, um, New American Standard. I had the message. I had different. Uh, different uh, Bible perversions growing up. I was a professing Christian most of my life. I went to these Babel buildings growing up. I went to Bible college um, and they were shoving Catholic Bibles down our throats. If you look at the Nestle's Elan, the Catholic Church puts out the Nestle's Elan. Westcott and Hort were both Catholics. All these other Bibles are Catholic Bibles. And if you're seeking truth and you want absolute truth, me telling you that, me telling you something as simple as 99% less than 1%, that right there should pique your interest to say what's going on. Backed by over 99%, backed by less than 1%. I don't care if they say they're the two oldest and great manuscripts over here. It doesn't matter. Less than 1%. I tell you, this comes from Antioch, Syria, where Christians were first called Christians, and this one comes from Alexandria, Egypt. That should raise a red flag and pique your interest. Uh, what does the Bible think about Egypt? They're philosophers. They took scriptures and perverted them and made them say what they wanted them to say. Those two things alone should get you piqued and interested in studying the Bible version issue. And I have a brother in Christ... Um, and I have, gosh, there's a few people I can recommend. Um, right now, I don't agree with David Daniels and his drawing of the Godhead and him standing for, and we'll get to that in another section, um, for the Trinity. But he's got some books that I'll still buy for people and hand them out, and I already have, about the Bible version issue. He's really good about it. Brother Brian over at King James Video Ministries, really good about it. Um, I really don't support... Oh gosh, what's his name? C. 
Sam Gipp, uh, not that his stand for the King James Bible is good. Uh, the Answer Book is a good one for you to get by Sam Gipp. It's the only book I like. Um, there's good things to teach. If you're truly seeking truth, you will find it. And I applaud. Uh, I applaud. Sometimes I have problems with words. I plead with you to look into it, okay? Don't just say, okay, my pastor up there says it's the NIV or all Bibles are okay because he says it, it's great. Just because I say it doesn't mean that you have to grab a King James Bible today because I say it's the Word of God. Study the issue. It just, it, it always gets to me sometimes. Um, brothers and sisters in Christ, you know this. It gets to me that my whole life using Bible perversions and I wasn't seeking the truth back then. When I started truly seeking the truth, God brought to, through a brother in Christ, he brought me to the Bible version issue. And I watched the videos and I saw both sides and I'm like, and a heartbeat said, I want a King James Bible. I picked up this book and I can't put it down. This book has changed my life. The Holy Spirit, and we'll get to some verses on that. The Holy Spirit, through you, will attest to this book and help you clean up your life, tell you what truth is, tell you what you're supposed to be doing, what you're not supposed to be doing. Okay? It teaches you, you learn the gospel through someone speaking it, but they only heard, got the gospel because it's in here. Okay? So, um, the biggest thing also, this ministry, if you've known, um, words have meaning. Okay? I go through the Bible and I do word studies um, because I want brothers and sisters in Christ out there to realize that words have meaning. My lost professing Christian life, someone would say, this word means this, and you just said, okay. You don't argue with them. You're not supposed to, we're all supposed to get along and be happy and smile like, you know, like there's something wrong with us, you know. You need to look into things for yourself. If someone uses a word, there's so many words I thought I knew what they meant, and there isn't. There, I, I go to look them up, and I'm like, I didn't know it meant that. I didn't know it could also mean this. Sometimes they use uniform translation where they say this word means the same thing every time. Not uniform translation. I call it uniform definition. Uniform translation is they put the same word, period, whatever that Greek word was, when it could be multiple different types of words. Um... But I call it uniform definition. Well, if it says the word here, it means that every time. Okay? No, words have meaning. So make sure that you're trying to get the context of the word. I use a Webster's 1828 dictionary. Please get one of those uh, in like the book form in paperback. I have Strong's Concordance in paperback. I suggest that you get one. Um, and then I do most of my work on the computer. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say you should only do that. I have this backup. Power goes out. Um, you start can't finding this stuff online. It starts getting so bad you can't find any programs online. They're getting shut down. Um, I know there's programs for sword searching you can put on your computer, but you know what I'm saying? Power goes out. They shut down your internet, whatever. It's always good to have hard copies. Okay. Would you just want a computer that has the Bible on there, or, would you, or do you want to actually have the Bible in your hands? So then it, should, it wouldn't hurt to have the uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary in your hand, along with a, a Bible concordance. Uh, the Strong's Concordance. Ignore the Hebrew and Greek in the back, but the first half, I think it is, where it tells you you can look up words. That's what a concordance is. You say the word um, boy. How many times, where can I look up the word boy? And it'll show you every verse that the word boy is in. That's what a concordance is. Um, just use that part of the book. Ignore the Hebrew and Greek. I don't speak it. Chances are, even the people who claim to be scholars, they don't speak it. It hasn't been a spoken language in a long, long time. So I don't speak it. You don't speak it. Um, just ignore it. But remember, this ministry is all about words have meaning. Make sure you're looking at the definition of words, uh, the context of the words. Um, it's very, very important, and you'll realize that you've been lied to sometimes, or you've saw something the wrong way, because you just assumed the word meant this, or you've heard the word so many times that you don't even know what it means, but you're just like, mm-hmm, uh-huh, I've done it. Someone goes through it so fast that you're like, just in the back of your head, you're like, oh, oh well, it sounded like a cool word. 
But it's got to mean something positive, so, oh well. And you never really look into it. The great example is rapture. Okay? I believe in the catching away of the body of Christ, and we're going to get to that. But the word rapture, you look up the definition, it means taken by force, with violence. Uh, when we get caught up, I'm not going to fight God. He says, Philip Newton, come up hither. Yes, Lord, take me. Take me. I'm ready. There won't, there won't be this, let go of me. I'm not ready to go. Let go of me. I'm, I'm not going. And God's like, Rrr! and yanking us up. That's what rapture means. Okay? Catching away the body of Christ is the proper term. Caught up is in the Bible. Okay? God's going to say, come on up, and we're going to be praising the Lord. We're ready. Take us. We want to come home. This isn't our home. We want to come home. Words have meaning. Okay? This book, the King James Bible, is should be your matters. Let's see how I say this right. Should be the foundation in all matters of faith and practice. Okay? What you believe needs to be backed on this King James Bible. How you live your life and what you stand for needs to be backed by this Bible. No traditions of men are what men says. Okay? I've already said that, I think. Um, about, uh, you know, it's not about what the man behind the pulpit says, or these Babel buildings, it's not about what I say, it's not about, you can learn from me, you can learn from other brothers in Christ, but it better, you better have your Bible open, and you better make sure that what I'm saying is lining up with this. I can make mistakes, I'm not perfect. Other brothers and sisters in Christ, um, when they're trying to tell you something, um, I'm saying brothers for videos, but sisters in Christ can talk to people, you know, and say, hey, God showed me this, witnessing, God showed me that. Uh, someone can come up to a sister in Christ and ask her a question, and she can answer it and then point them to a ministry that a man's doing, absolutely. But you need to make sure it's backed by Scripture. Okay? This is your foundation. It should be the foundation of your home, your life, your walk with the Lord, your marriage, being a parent, I mean, I can go on and on, being a brother in Christ, being a friend, I mean, it's all in here. You always point Jesus Christ to the solution to all, their pro of all your problems. Jesus Christ is the solution to all your problems. Right here is his word. If a man love me, he will keep my word. Okay? So that's what we believe here. We believe the King James God Bible is God's perfect written word in English. Next topic. Dispensational teaching. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, rightly dividing. Now a lot of people are going to fight us on this, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and if you're new to this like I was when I first got saved, you're new to a baby Christian as they say, all the Bible is written for us, but it's not all written to us. Okay. What's that mean? Um, if I write a letter to my brother, and I say something in there to him, I say something in there to his wife, like she knitted me a scarf, so I, she did do that, and um, I thank her for doing the scarf and her knitting and everything, and then I met, have three... Uh, Ne two nephews and a niece, and I talk to each one individually in the letter, they're reading the letter out loud. The letter's for everybody. But there's certain parts in that letter that's directed at specific people. My brother, his wife, my nephew, this other nephew, my niece. So the whole letter is not written to my brother. Right? You know what I'm saying? That's the whole point of dispensational teaching. I have another analogy to give saying, 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of, God may be per man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Okay. That's what we get from scripture. Instruction and in righteousness is everywhere. You can get instruction and in righteousness a lot in the Old Testament. There's a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to the New Testament. But major doctrine is going to be found in the New Testament. The Old Testament is just going to verify it. But if you can't find it in the New Testament, you're not going to be grabbing stuff from the Old Testament saying this is major doctrine. Okay? Let's see. And then a reproof and correction. We use this book to correct ourselves, to correct our brothers and sisters in Christ. And the laws that God has written in our hearts as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. 
So this book is also used to let the lost world know that they're sinners and that they've sinned against God. All right. Another way to explain dispensation is two different ways. I already explained one. Uh, another way is you have a, a gardener, electrician, and a plumber. You don't go up to the plumber, plumber and say, okay, I need these bushes trimmed and this lawn mowed. And then you go to the electrician and say, I've got these leaking pipes underneath the house, I need them fixed. You don't go to the gardener and say, uh, these, this electrical wiring looks like it's bad and it's burning out and everything, I need you to fix it. No, you go to the right people and tell them, okay, plumber fixes the pipes, electrician fixes the electrical system, gardener will take care of the bushes and the lawn. Okay, it's called dispensation, you put things out to the right people. Another way to look at it too is this. You have a house that has old electrical system, old plumbing, whatever, something that's old and the man goes to fix it and at that time that those piping were put in it was considered the latest technology. He's got a book, he opens it up and he's like, okay this is what I need to do to fix this, we can replace that, we can build it this way because this is the technology we have. You skip ahead 20 years. The guy comes to a new house, he's got a book that teaches him how to teach the, how to fix the old stuff. This is all new technology. Am I going to give him the same book that fixes the old stuff? Or am I going to say, okay, here's, an, here's the new book. Okay, we have the Old Testament, here's the New Testament. Okay. So you're not supposed to be going to the Old Testament to find doctrine and everything. There's dis different dispensations throughout the Bible, and there's some good teachings on it. Peter Ruckman has a great teaching on it, um, the different dispensations that he's got a chart and everything, and they call this dispensation that we're in now, the church age, the easiest time to get saved is today. So if you're not saved, you need to get saved today. So, we believe in dispensational, dispensational teaching, if I can get the word out here. Okay, the next thing is eternal security. We believe that once God's looked at your heart, we talked about the gospel, and I'm pleading with the lost world to get saved, time is running out, now is the day of salvation. God will look at your heart and see if you're genuine. If it's not just up here, it's got to be down here. You can believe in vain, or that belief can be in your heart. Okay. God looks at your heart and says, okay, I'm going to save that man. I'm going to save that woman. And once he's done that, you're saved. We're going to get through some verses, but you are saved. You cannot lose your uh, salvation. God saved you. You, are not going to, you can't lose your salvation and go to hell at that point. Eternal security. You are secure. Your destination is heaven at that point. Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You get saved, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You cannot lose your salvation. 1 John 5.13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Kind of goes back to the perfect written record. Without a perfect written record, you wouldn't be able to believe on the name of the Son of God. Because it is written. Okay? But it's also written, we have a perfect written word, so you can know you have eternal life. There is no doubt in your salvation, wondering if you're saved. You'll get to a point, I understand newly saved people might struggle with that a little bit, but you're going to get to a point where you're like, okay, I believe all these things that I'm talking about, and I've had a changed life, God is still working on me, um, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Lord, come get us. We're, I'm ready. Um, oh, I'm, you know, I have, my teaching because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I always teach that the whole point of looking for the coming of the Lord is sanctification, that you're always trying to spend every day like He could come back today, and you're looking at your life, am I doing work for the Lord? Am I preaching the gospel? Am I reading my Bible daily? Am I still making spiritual sacrifices? My home a godly home? God could come back today. Okay, it's a... It's a self-reflection, okay, when you're looking up saying, God, can you come back today? Uh, not that you'll always be ready, okay, my life is still full of things that God's showing me to get rid of and clean up, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Let's see, Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, 
which is what I'm trying to do, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. When you get saved, Jesus Christ died for you, his blood washes your sin away. Jesus is God. God purchased you with his blood. He owns you. You belong to him. Okay? It's not your salvation, it's God's. He's the one that saved you. You belong to him. You cannot lose your salvation. Someone can't come along and snatch it away. It belongs to God. You belong to God. 1 Corinthians 6.19 What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Now I know there's a lot of other good verses in there for eternal security. You're sealed into the day of redemption. Um, but I just wanted to throw a few out there. And the main point I want to get here is A, you're sealed. Nobody can take it. And your salvation is not your own. It's God's. You belong to God. Okay. We believe at this ministry you cannot lose your salvation once God has saved you. Now I've said a lot of ones that there's false converts out there. People who believe in their head and they're believing in vain. They skip repentance. They don't, nowadays they're taking prayer out. They don't even want to start their personal relationship. They even, they even mock the concept of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ with God through Jesus Christ. They even mock that now. So there's a difference between us saying, hey, that person's false. Not that they lost their salvation, they were never saved to begin with. That's one thing. But there's people that are saved that fall away. But once you are saved, you're sealed into the day of redemption. Okay? You're going to heaven. Now, Dispensational teaching, we talk about the true gospel. Dispensational teaching, eternal security, the Godhead. Okay, Here, that lately that's become a big thing, the Godhead versus the Trinity. Okay, We don't believe in the Trinity. I don't believe in the Trinity. Okay, The Trinity is pagan. You do a study on it and you look into it, it, everything works together. I mean, you start doing studies, everything seems to work together. One of the biggest things is words have meaning. And if you have that attitude when you're studying the Bible, words have meaning, then you look and you look in the Bible and you say, well, Trinity is not in the Bible. Does that really mean much? Yeah, it should. It is now in my life. After all, doing a lot of the studying and realizing I've been deceived a lot, a lot of that deception was people bringing in words that weren't found in the Bible. That, a lot of the things I was deceived as a false convert were these Bible perversions that changed the Word of God and other people even bringing in their own concept and their own words. So I start putting up a shield, a guard, if you were, will, and I make sure that if someone tells me something, it's found in the Bible. They're using the capital T, Trinity, a title for God, saying you need to believe in the Trinity. You open the Bible, where's that title for God in this Bible, in the King James Bible? It's not there. So then what is that title? Well, you look up the word Godhead, capital G, a title for God, and it's in the Bible. You'll find it in here. So then I'm like, I'm not using Trinity, the word Trinity anymore. It doesn't have to do with the belief yet. We'll get into that. It doesn't have to do with what the Trinity believes. It's just the word itself, not in the Bible, and it's not a title for God. I'm not going to use it. Okay. So 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I still have brothers out there doing videos, and they still slip up. It's hard, I understand, because we've been lied to and deceived and taught a certain way for so many years, and God shows us, hey, what you're doing is wrong. And they'll still slip up and say, in one. And that's not what the Bible teaches. These three are one. The Godhead teaches that the Father, God the Father, the Word, capital W Word, is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost are one. Not three in one, they are one. Okay? The Bible says, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we in Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by Him. There's only one God, the Father. So, there's not God the Father. There is God the Father, but there's not God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's only one God. These three are one. There's only one God. There is no God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's only God the Father. 
And if you believe in the true Godhead, then you believe that Jesus Christ is God, the Father. There's only one God, the Father. You believe Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. Body, soul, and spirit. I'll do some links down there. Um, God the Father is the soul. Jesus Christ is the body. The Holy Spirit is the spirit. Okay, these three are one. We are made in His image. Uh, Colossians 2.9 For in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We're doing a word study right now and uh, on the word person. And people think it's a little tedious. But it's important. It is so important to go through and do a word study on person. Why? Because they're trying to say God in three persons. Words have meaning. What's a person? Someone who has a body and a soul. And it's always referred to someone who's living. Spirit. So a person is someone who has a body, soul, and spirit. So according to that verse, Colossians 2.9, Jesus Christ is the only person of the Godhead. And four times is Jesus referred to as a person in the Bible. Three in the New Testament, one in the Old. God the Father is never referenced to as a person, and the Holy Spirit is never referenced to as a person. Yet the Trinity teaches God in three persons. But the average person you talk to about the Trinity will say, uh, we don't believe God the Father has his own body, soul, and spirit. And we don't believe that, you know, the Holy Spirit has his own body, soul, and spirit of his own. And I know that. But then why are you saying God in three persons? That's the part that gets me. I've talked to people and that really vehemently stand for the Trinity. And some of them have had grace. Some of them had dropped their pride when it comes to this, and they looked into it, and I've made some points to them that made them go and look into it a little bit further and go, you know what, you're right. It isn't God in three persons. I never believed it was the way that the word persons is defined in the Bible, body, soul, and spirit. I never believed that, but you're right. I was using terms that promoted a false God. I was using a system, Trinity, that was promoting a false God. And they say, you know what, I'm supposed to be a King James Bible believer, I'm going to stick to the Bible. Bible says Godhead, I'm going to say Godhead. Bible says Jesus is the only person of the Godhead, then I'm only going to say Jesus is a person. I'm not going to say God in three persons. There's only one God the Father, I'm not going to say God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Okay? And there's plenty, plenty of verses that I'll link some studies that show that Jesus claims to be the Father. God the Father. Because if he's not God, then what good could his death do on the cross? What good could his blood do for you if Jesus isn't God? There's only one God, the Father. If Jesus isn't the Father, his blood can do nothing to you, for you. God himself, God the Father, said he purchased you with his own blood. Okay? But it's, like I said, it's a big in-depth study. This is uh, me just throwing out what we believe here. We believe in the King James Bible. We believe the Godhead. Okay. Um, and a lot of people ask, I, I think I did a good video. I don't know. A lot, some people liked it. I'm not trying to be prideful, but I'm just trying to remember about why the controversy on the Godhead. Well, the number one, one reason was is 1 Timothy 3.16, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto, unto the Gentiles, believed in the world, received up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.9 Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Okay. Why is there a big controversy? Because people are trying to explain how the Godhead works. I almost said what? The Bible tells us what the Godhead is. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the body, God manifests in the flesh, and the Holy Spirit of God, the Father. These three are one. That's all we're supposed to believe. How does it work? That's where the mystery comes in. How can they be spoken of as separate, yet they're all one? Body, soul, and spirit. How can the soul and the body be one, and yet there's times where it shows them being separate when they say they are one. I can't explain how it works. That's where people get messed up. You don't have to know how it works. We'll find out when we get to heaven. We have a body, soul, and spirit. The Bible talks about when you get saved, 
that you're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus right now. So my soul is here, but it's also in heaven, two places at once. How is that possible? I don't know. I do not know. So we believe in the true biblical Godhead. Three in one. That Jesus Christ is God the Father, the Holy Spirit is God the Father, the God the Father is Jesus Christ. You can do God the Father is the Holy Spirit. Because it says God the Father raised Jesus, then it said no, the Holy Spirit raised Jesus, no, God ra or Jesus raised himself from the dead. That's because all three are one. They're all one. Okay, it gets confusing when you start saying, but how is that possible? A bird comes down, God the Father is in heaven saying, this is my son of whom I'm and Jesus, how is that? That's when you get screwed up. I don't know how it works. I can only tell you what the Bible says it is. I can tell you what the Godhead is. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son of God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. They're one. Not three separate that make up one, they are one. Okay, there's distinction, but they are one. Body, soul, and spirit, that's what we what I believe here. Okay. So after the Godhead we have the pre time of Jacob's trouble. People are like, well what is that? What is that? Um, I fought first God as a false Christian, a lot of the stuff we're going through, I wasn't taught much anything as a false Christian. You go to these battle buildings and it's just party time. I was playing the bass guitar on the uh, worship team, helping out with the youth, teaching them when it's their parents' job to teach them the Bible. I was doing it, but I really wasn't teaching them squat, you know, just ways of the world, doing it in a worldly way, I guess is the best way to say it. But I wasn't taught a lot of this stuff. I learned this stuff after I truly got saved and became a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. But when I did, I first learned out of it, they call it the Great Tribulation, capital T, using it as a title for the seven-year period where God's going to be pouring out His wrath on this planet. But then as I got into the study, I realized that's not a title for that seven-year time period. The only title for that seven-year time period is the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. The time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Old Testament. Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall, but he shall be saved out of it. The time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel's 70th week is another term that's used. Title. But for the whole seven years, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. What does that mean exactly? I believe, because the Bible teaches it, that the body of Christ is going to be caught up. Remember I told you about words have meaning between rapture and caught up. Uh, the body of Christ is going to be caught up. We call it the cat catching away of the body of Christ. We're going to be caught up before that seven-year period starts. Seven, if I can do it right, not two. Uh, the seven-year period starts. We are going to be taken out. The body of Christ is going to be taken out before that time period. Okay. First Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then, which, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's why I look up sometimes when we have good clouds in the skies. To meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. When you tell somebody, you know what? You're going to have to go through that seven-year period. God's going to be pouring His wrath out on you. Is that a comfort? You're going to go through the worst time period on earth. Is that a comfort? No. The comfort is that we're leaving before that happens. Okay? And the biggest thing to prove it is the, is the uh, title the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is another word for Israel. God's focusing back on Israel, the Jewish people, during that seven-year period. There will be Gentiles through it, don't get me wrong, but the focus is back on the Jewish people. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? In this present world, the church age, what we call the church age, this, this, what we call this dispensation, when I told you about dispensational teachings, okay? We are looking for the great glorious, what is it? Glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking for Jesus Christ to come back. And those that tell you, that to try to take away that blessed hope, they tell you that you're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. And anybody that knows the Bible will say, well then, I'm not looking for Jesus Christ, I'm looking for the Antichrist. You're looking for the Antichrist to come, not Jesus Christ. But the Bible says we are to look for Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 15, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And the reason I threw that in there, the Bible says we, we are not appointed to God's wrath. We are part of His body, flesh of His flesh. Uh, you're telling me God's going to pour out His wrath on Himself? Something to think about. Okay? Here's another one, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Particular, if I can say it right. We're part of his body. Is God going to pour out his wrath on his body? And they're going to use all kinds of tricks to deceive you, saying, well, God's wrath it technically isn't poured out right away. He unleashes the Antichrist who goes and makes war. Deceives people. He promises peace, but brings war. I think this is a proper term. Don't let them deceive you. The best study I've ever seen that really drove it home for me was um, Brother Brian at King James Video Ministry said, did a video called The False God of Post-Trib Christians. And he put Christians in a parenthesis. Or, yeah. In other words, who knows if they're Christians? God does. You know, like they call themselves Christian doesn't mean they are. But the whole study talks about how God will not pour out his wrath on the righteous along with the wicked. Jesus Christ's righteousness is imputed to me. God looks at me and sees God at Jesus Christ and what he did for me. He doesn't see my wicked, sinful, abominable self, this wicked flesh. He sees Jesus Christ. Christ's righteousness is imputed to someone who gets saved. The lost world, they have their own self-righteousness. So when God's pouring out his wrath, he never pours out his wrath on the righteous along with the wicked. And it's a great teaching showing that. It's just another example. But there's scripture after scripture after scripture separating the two. The two people that go through the time of Jacob's trouble versus the catching away of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. God will not pour out his wrath on the righteous along with the wicked. And God will not pour out his wrath on his own body. Remember, I'm just throwing some few verses here. There probably could have been a lot better verses I could use. I will link some of the studies down below that open my eyes to the truth, that go into great depth, like playlists and stuff like that. I'll be linking below. Um, just remember that time's running out. I've done videos recently showing how they're about to rebuild the temple. They have the priesthood, they got the robes made, they've got the candlestick, gosh, I keep forgetting, the menorah, I think is what it's called. They've got everything ready. It's all ready. All they need is the temple. Right now, India and China are on the verge of being a cashless society. The technology for the mark of the beast is here. The technology is. They're trying to call this the mark of the beast or that the mark of the beast, I think, to deceive people. Even, but it's the technology that will lead to the mark of the beast, but A, the beast isn't here, and the mark's not required to buy or sell. So to call it the mark, you don't call it the mark unless those two things apply. But the technology is here. Um, we have a one world language. It's English. And people will try to deny it and, and fight that and everything, and you look back down to the Tower of Babel where they all had one language, so there's nothing that could keep from them. In other words, they could do almost anything because they could work together with one language. And God split up the language. Uh, the world's gotten back to one language. I've been all over the world. So when people say you don't know anything, I've been all over the world. Every country I've been in, Australia, Okinawa, Japan, Thailand, China, the Philippines, Germany, France, um, of course Great Britain, and uh, Canada... 
even go down to Mexico. I can't remember if I ever did get to go down there. I was close. Um, everywhere you go, English is a second language to their native tongue. You look at air, airline pilots, they're required to speak English, okay? Um, because they're traveling all over, they always speak English. English has become a number one language of this world, a universal language. Um, they talk about a one world religion. Part of me looks into it, and I might do a video on it, where it's like we have a universal religion today. Uh, you believe what you want, and you get to go to heaven. There's many paths to heaven. We just need to all come together and realize that there's heaven, that we're going to someplace great. It doesn't matter if you believe in Muhammad, uh, Buddha, uh, if you're an atheist, or whatever. Um, you know, we just all need to come together and we all are, we're all aiming to go to the same place. We're all working for the same... It's like one world religion. We're just that close. Everything is right there. The time is coming and time is running out. If you're not saved, get saved. Come to God broken. Time is running out. That's what I mean by time is running out. I'll put up uh, the gospel message to people on um, the message under YouTube, the comments and stuff, that if I believe they're lost or by scripture, not my opinion, or I even think they might be lost, I'd rather err on the side of caution, but a lot of times people that are fighting eternal security, they're lost. They're fighting um, the Godhead. They know everything about it, but they choose to serve a false god, the Trinity. I'll throw out the gospel. When I say time is running out, I'm not being a smart aleck or something. I actually mean it. I see how wicked this world is getting. It's like Sodom and Egypt everywhere. And everything. You can't leave your house without seeing Sodom and Egypt. It's that bad. They're openly worshiping Satan in the open. They're not hiding it. Uh, Super Bowl, I haven't watched Super Bowl in forever, but I heard some stories about um, halftime. All these, like Katy Perry, all these people that I hardly know who they are, but they're riding out on bulls and all this imagery is just totally satanic and wicked. You do that 50 years ago, they would have, nobody would have put up with it. They'd say, you're a Satanist, get away from me. But today it's out in the open. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah. We've got a one world langu uh, language, English. Um, they're trying to get it's getting really close to one world religion. The mark of the beast system's here. The temple's about to be rebuilt. They've got everything set up and ready to go. As soon as the temple's built, everything's in there. The red heifer. Uh, first red heifer that was born um, in two, I think said 2,000 years. So, yeah, uh, time is running out. The catching away of the body of Christ is about to happen. Okay. So, these are all the major doctrines. Let's see, I just want to go over it again. The true gospel. Okay, talks about the true gospel, hell. Okay, hell is real. Then we talked about dispensational teaching, the Bible version issue. Make sure that you've got a King James Bible, get a King James Bible. We believe in the King James Bible. Dispensational teaching, the Godhead. Okay. And now, eternal security. We talked about eternal security. And I might come out if I left something out. I hope I didn't. But the, the main doctrines, eternal security, true gospel, the Bible version issue, dispensational teaching, the Godhead, uh, pre-time of Jacob's trouble. These are all important things because if you don't believe in a pre-time of Jacob's trouble, you believe in a God, a different God than the God of the Bible. If you don't, if you believe you can lose your salvation, then you believe in a different God than that of the Bible. Because the Bible says you're sealed into the day of redemption. If you believe in anything other than the Godhead, you're not believing in the God of the Bible. The Jesus Christ of the Bible. The Jesus Christ of the Bible. The real Jesus Christ of the Bible. The Bible talks about how Jesus said there'd be many antichrists. Okay? False Jesus is out there that people are putting their faith in. A false Jesus is an antichrist Jesus. The true gospel, Satan doesn't want you getting saved, so he's been perverting the gospel. Okay.